The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. The story of Sam Houston. Adapted for radio from Sam Houston, the Raven. The Pulitzer Prize winning biography by Marquis James. With Walter Houston, star of stage, screen, and radio as Sam Houston. The DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, brings you the Cavalcade of America. Tonight, instead of our story about the Pilgrim Fathers, as announced, we are presenting the drama of a great, colorful American character, Sam Houston. And here is Dr. Frank Monaghan, professor of history at Yale University, the Cavalcade of America's historical advisor, Dr. Monaghan. In certain dramatic moments of the past, the fate of a nation has marched side by side with that of an individual. These individuals are the molders of the future. Destiny often twists them about round a point which they cannot, at the moment, recognize. Certainly, Sam Houston did not early realize that the events of a January day in 1829 would shatter his own pattern of life and shape the course of American history. When Houston was born, George Washington was president of the United States. At the time of his death, Abraham Lincoln was guiding the nation through a civil war. Sam Houston in his, his time was many things. School teacher, soldier, lawyer. He was the governor of Tennessee, a United States senator, the first president of the Republic of Texas. At one time, he seemed scheduled for the presidency of the United States. This office is one which most men do not deliberately avoid. Yet Sam Houston, when all seemed most promising, renounced it all. He defied destiny, but he could not escape it. Tonight, we introduce Sam Houston at a decisive turning point, not merely in his own career, but in the history of the United States. This turning point was the 22nd of January, 1829. Snow is falling over the Cumberland Valley in Tennessee. The best society of the valley is assembling at Colonel John Allen's plantation home for the marriage of his daughter Eliza to the most eligible bachelor in the state, General Sam Houston, governor of Tennessee. The bride's mother is adjusting the wedding veil. <laughs> Eliza, stop it, I'm <laughs> Please stop it. How can you behave this way? Mother, I, I can't help it. I can't help it. Do you want everyone to hear? How can you be so ungrateful after all Pop and I have tried to do for you? Oh, but, Mama, I don't love him. Oh, no, now every girl feels that way. I thought I didn't want to marry your father. Come along now. Dry your eyes. You'll see. You'll be all right. Nothing will ever be right if I marry him. I won't. I won't go through with it. Eliza, you don't know what you're saying. The finest man this side of the Allegheny. Oh, no. A friend of the president himself. <laughs> You'll thank your lucky star someday. <laughs> why, why, you might even be the first lady of the land. Oh, please, Mother. There's the music. Come on, honey, dry your eyes. It's time to start downstairs. You're a beautiful bride, dear. Meanwhile, downstairs in the dining room, the lofty mahogany-paneled walls glisten in the candlelight. Around a long, darkly gleaming table stand Colonel Allen, his tall, handsome son, several gentlemen of the Cumberland Valley, <laughs> and General Sam Houston. Here's to you, Sam. I drink to your re-election as governor of Tennessee. I second that toast. Just a minute, gentlemen. Let me propose the toast to Sam Houston. And to the day when my daughter becomes the first lady of the land. Good luck, Sam. You've always had it. May you always keep it. Yes, indeed. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's true, I am a lucky man. I'd like to have you all join me now in a toast to one who has brought me the best luck a man could ever have. Gentlemen, to the very fiber of my life, to the one who, well, you know what I'm trying to say, to the lady who has consented to become my wife, Eliza Allen. Father, Eliza's ready. She's coming down the stairs. All right, Sonny. Come, let us go, gentlemen. All right.
Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her, so long as we both shall live? I will. Eliza Allen, wilt thou have this man to be thy wedded husband? Wilt thou love him, honor and obey him, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him? So long as you both shall live. I will. Eliza? Yes? May I come in? Yes. Come in. Oh, Eliza, I missed you. I looked everywhere for you, but... It's all right now. Oh, you were so lovely. The center of all eyes. I don't blame you wanting to be alone for a while. Yes, I know. My, listen to that wind. Yes, darling, I hear it. Eliza. Yes? What's the matter? Matter? I love you, Eliza. Oh. Remember the first time I saw you? You were so sweet. A radiant, lovely young girl. The next time you were a woman, still as sweet and radiant. Only you had grown far more lovely. And when I looked into your eyes, I, I thought of what Indian lovers say to each other. Your soul comes into the very center of my soul. It's, it's cold in here. Can't we... Eliza, are you shy with my arms around you? No. No, I'm not. I... You shouldn't be, my dear. Of course not. Not with an old friend like you, Sam. Old friend? Why don't you speak plainly? No. No, there's, there's nothing, nothing to say. There must be something. Isn't there? Say it, dear. I can't. I can't say yes, it. Yes, yes, you can. You must. What is it, Eliza? Tell me. Don't. Don't ask me. I've got to know, Eliza. I have a right to know. Now, what is it? Are you blind? You ought to know it. I don't love you. I never have and I never will because I love someone else. You married me in love with another man? Yes, yes, I did. How many times must I tell you? Yes, I married you because my father wanted me to. Because you're a great man. The governor of Tennessee. Your father made you do this? Please. Don't say any more. Please, leave me alone. Good night, Eliza. Sam Houston and his bride hid the sorrow that had come into their lives as admiring throngs cheered them on the way to Nashville. A few weeks passed, and then one night in his home, Sam Houston opens the parlor door. Oh, Sam, you startled me. Good evening, Eliza. I didn't expect you home so soon. You needn't bother to conceal that letter in your skirt. We don't have any secrets, Eliza. I think we understand each other. It's nothing. Let's not talk about it. I think we should. There are many things we ought to talk about. There's nothing more to say. You know, and I know. Eliza, I tell you, it is not too late. We can start all over again. Take my love. A love that shall be yours every minute, every no, hour. No, Sam. This must be the end. Let's stop this mockery now. No, no, you don't mean that. Yes, Sam, I do. Here's your wedding ring. Take it. Well, why don't you? Please. Please, Eliza. Can't we try again? No, it would be useless. You know that. Here's your ring. Now I'm going to say goodnight. Please, Eliza, please. Listen, forgive me. It's my fault. Forgive me and try to understand this torment in me. But don't leave me, Eliza. Don't leave me. We can go on together. I need you so, my darling. Eliza, wait. Where are you going? To pack my clothes and go home. Good 
Listen to them out there, Sam. They say you wronged your bride, a southern woman, an Allen. They're angry because, well, because they don't understand. But we've known each other since your ma brought you to Tennessee in a wagon. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, Sam? I hear you. I can finish this letter and listen. Well, then, you've got to tell the folks why, Eliza. Well, what is it to say? It isn't for the public. It's a private affair, and as far as I'm concerned, it will remain so. It won't be that way, Sam. Folks are looking for you to say something. You're the governor. You just can't do things that way. I'm resigning as governor. Sam, no, yes. you mustn't do it. Yes, here's the letter, Sheriff. Deliver it to the Speaker of the Senate. Sam, Sam, you can't do this. I've made up my mind. You'll realize I did the right thing after I've gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone, Sam? I'm going away, Sheriff. Somewhere where there's kindness and peace. And I'm never coming back. That night, the fire blazes brightly in Sam Houston's study. He's burning his personal papers. At sunrise, he boards the river packet Red Rover, and the little steamboat churns downstream. At Clarksville, the last stop in Tennessee, two men come aboard. Sam, two of the Allen boys are aboard. They want to speak with you. They may. Very well, gentlemen. You got something to say to you, Sam Houston? Now take your hands off your guns, boys. I'll listen to you. You're coming ashore with us, Sam. You'll see about that. What do you want? Folks are saying you ran away because you questioned our sister, Eliza's honor. You either give us a written denial of this rumor, or come back to Nashville with us and deny it in public. We have much time. The passengers are looking this way. So make up your mind. I will do neither. Take care. Will you passengers bear witness to the request I entrust to my brothers-in-law? Yes. Thank you. And now, gentlemen, I bid you to publish in the Nashville papers that if any wretch ever dares to utter a word against the purity of Mrs. Houston, I will come back and write the libel in his heart's blood. Good day, gentlemen. Sam Houston vanished from the white man's civilization to take up his life in the wilderness that is now Oklahoma. In the domain of the Cherokee Indians, a people with whom he lived as a boy, the Cherokee chieftain, Ulatika, who had once adopted Sam as his son and called him the Raven, advances and embraces him. My son, my son. My chieftain, I am thankful for your welcome. Eleven winters have passed since we met. I have heard you were a great chief among your people. I have heard... A dark cloud had fallen on the white path you were walking. The wind has whispered truly, Ulatika. I'm no longer a chief among our white brothers. We are in great trouble, my son. Trouble? The bellies of 7,000 of our braves are empty. The men, the great white father, they did, did not pay us fully for the lands in Tennessee. And here, there is no game. But what of the food the government supplies? We have meat supplied us by an agent. But it is bad meat, my son. My chieftain, you're being cheated. Not by the great white father. For President Andrew Jackson is my friend and I know. But by men he trusts. I will go to him and put a stop to this injustice. Because now, you are my people. I shall leave these forests and go to the great white father in Washington and tell him of these wrongs. By the tarnal Sam Houston, what's the idea coming in the White House togged out in that wigwam blanket? We could tend to your business without you putting on moccasins that Indian shirt. I don't like it. I'm coming to you as ambassador for the Cherokees, Mr. President. But uh, that's why I'm dressed as one. Well, how have things been going with you? Uh, not so good, Sam. Mm -hmm. These cussed hypocrites in Washington stir up trouble every chance they get. That's what brings me to Washington, Mr. President. These men you sent to deal with the Cherokees cheated both you and the Indians. They're still doing it. It's got to stop, Mr. President. You mean I've been trusting a pack of horses? That's what I mean. The Cherokees were cheated out of their land... And now they're getting bad meat. 
Then by the tunnel, we'll draw up a new rations contract. What do you suggest, Sam? Well, uh, I could supply rations for about, uh, oh, about 18 cents a day. That sounds mighty fair to me, Sam. Why, instead of all this cussedness, can't people be square in their dealings? That's what I can't see at all. Yeah, they said I'd find you out here on the porch, Mr. President, when I was to come out. <clears throat> yes, so you did, General Green. Uh, Sam Houston, meet General Duff Green. Uh, How do you do, Houston? General Green publishes the United States Telegraph. Hmm? Say, I, I don't like to interrupt, Mr. President, but they... No, been... no, that's all right. Houston and I have been talking about a contract for supplying rations to Cherokee Indians. The guarantee to the Cherokees and payment for their lands in Tennessee, General Green. Well, what's the trouble? This government supplies rations to those savages. Yes, rotten meat, General Green. If you had nothing else for your table, I think you'd prefer to starve and grow thinner. Present ration costs the government 21 cents a day, and by the tunnel, it's mighty unsatisfactory. Houston says he could supply a good ration for 18 cents, saving $12,000 a day. Now, I can't share your enthusiasm, Mr. President, but I can see how General Houston's offer will line his pocket with a fine profit. This will become known, and you'll be in trouble if I may say so, Mr. President. I resent that, Green. Sit down, Sam. Sit down, I tell you. Will you excuse me now, General Green? Certainly. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. Sorry, I lost my temper. Oh, no, never mind that, Sam. I tell you what, we'll see that justice is done. Those Cherokees will get paid in full for their lands in Tennessee, and by the tunnel, I'll tell the Secretary of War to give you that ration contract. I thank you. Not for myself, General, but for my people. President Jackson failed to reckon with the power of his enemies. General Green's newspaper published sharp, caustic editorials against Sam Houston. One day, Houston enters the home of his friend, Congress Congressman Cave Johnson of Tennessee, angrily waving a newspaper. Look here, Cave. General Green has published a speech by William Stanberry, Congressman from Ohio. Were you in the house when Stanberry spoke? Yes, Sam, I was. Listen, Cave. Did he say the Secretary of War had been dismissed from the cabinet because he tried fraudulently to give me a contract to feed the Cherokees? Did he use that word, fraudulently? He did, Sam. That's all I want to know. Where's that walking stick I gave you? In the hat rack, ma'am. Mind if I borrow it for a few days? What on earth do you want with it? Well, no, <clears throat> nothing much. I, I just want to take a stroll down Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, teach a horse thief some manners. Beg pardon, sir. Are you Mr. Stanberry? I am, sir. I've been looking for you. You're a lying rascal. Keep your distance or I'll shoot. Oh, you won't. Trying to pull a pistol on me, eh? Uh, let go of me. Let go of me. You declared, you declared me a thief before Congress. You refused to answer my letter and fight like a gentleman. Then you'll be whipped like a dog. No, help! Help! <laughs> help! Like a dog. <laughs> Affairs disgraceful, Sam. By the tunnel, disgraceful. I know, Mr. President. But I did everything a gentleman could. I wrote Stanberry a letter. He sent it back unopened. No excuses. You've assaulted a member of Congress. A word spoken in his seat in the House of Representatives. Now you'll be arraigned and tried. Expect I will be, sir. I'm ashamed of you, Sam. Look at yourself in that old buckskin coat and Indian shirt. Haven't you any other clothes? No, sir, I haven't. Well, get some. Here, borrow this. Pick up that purse. Do as I say, sir. Buy yourself some civilized clothes. Look like Sam Houston. Representatives has heard Mr. Stanbury's testimony, charging the prisoner Sam Houston with violating the laws of the United States. The prisoner will now come forward out of the dais and conduct his defense. Mr. Speaker, members of Congress, I have committed no offense for which the Congress may punish me without invading the private rights of a citizen of these United States of America. 
On the wall above our heads hangs the symbol of those rights, the American flag. Before the eyes of American legislators, that proud emblem casts its sacred protection over the personal rights of every American citizen. Gentlemen, when you have destroyed the pride of American character, you will have destroyed the brightest jewel heaven has ever made. You will have drained the holiest drop which visits the hearts of your sages in council and the heroes in battle. But so long as those glittering stars remain aloft, so long I trust shall my rights, shall the rights of every American citizen remain safe. Your discord shall wreck the universe, and time itself shall see. Order! 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 Despite the fervor and eloquence of his plea, Sam Houston was sentenced to be reprimanded by the Speaker of the House. A few weeks after his trial, he goes to say farewell to his great friend at the White House and is received by Sarah York Jackson, the President's daughter-in-law. Sit down, General Houston. May I give you some tea? Thank you, Miss Sarah. Is the President at home? Papa will be in presently. He's expecting you. I have brought you a little farewell present, Miss Sarah. Oh, gracious me, another? You're always bringing us presents. Well, this one is a little more special. Since I left Nashville, I've worn it in a little chamois bag around my neck. For you, Miss Sarah. Oh. Oh. A ring. How lovely. Oh, thank no, you. No, no, don't thank me. It was always my wish for that ring to belong to someone very dear to me. I'm glad you're here, Sam. I'd like to speak to you. Oh, good afternoon, General. Sarah, will you excuse us? Certainly, Papa. Look, General Houston has given me another present. The most lovely ring. Yes. It's by the tunnel. That's a beauty. You said I mustn't thank you, General Houston. So I'll wear your ring and remember how fond of you we all are. That's fine music from you, Miss Sarah. Now run along, Sarah. Yes, Papa. I wager there's a present for you, too, in General Houston's pocket. <clears throat> Sam, wasn't that the ring you gave to your wife? Yes, it was. Then you don't want to go giving it away to Sarah. They may come when Eliza will ask you to give it back to her. I'd hope for a time Eliza might get over the way she felt about me. Now I know she won't. That's why I gave her ring to Sarah. She shuts the door. Now it's time to shut the door on another failure. Here's my farewell present for you, sir. My ceremonial Indian costume. Now listen, my boy. I wouldn't get all riled up over that work among the Cherokees if I was you. Maybe the politicians down here did wallop you for it. But I tell you what, Sam. You find out there's more people in this country than those croaking bullfrogs over in Congress. They're different people. They think different. They know what you were fighting for. And they've got their eyes on you now. Well, maybe you're right, sir. Sure I'm right. Show them nothing can lick you. You know, they know that you're a big man, Sam. And they know you can do big things. You've got a destiny in your own country. Destiny. Maybe that's it. Perhaps there's something more to a man's life than his own sorrows. I reckon they just sort of hit him in the heart to prepare him for something he doesn't understand. Maybe it's in the West that I'll find it. The Empire of Texas. Remember, General, I spoke to you once about Texas, and you said I wasn't ready then. But perhaps now my work lies in Texas. Texas. It's a big job, Sam. Texas should be in the Union. Should be, and by the tunnel it shall. That's what I promise you, General. By the eternal. <laughs> The raven disappears beyond the horizons of the West, where the America of his time was on the threshold of new and expanding frontiers. And the America that was to come achieved a new greatness because of the forceful genius of a man who, through suffering and a strange sense of destiny, became the liberator of the vast empire of Texas and a leader in the cavalcade of America.
Thank you, Walter Houston. We are honored to have you as our guest tonight of the DuPont Cavalcade. And now, before we hear from Dr. Monaghan about next week's program, we have a story from the wonder world of chemistry. If you were traveling in the southern part of the United States these January days, you'd see a familiar picture, perhaps be part of it. For already the southern farmer is doing his planting. In those tiny seeds he's planting, there's a making of success or failure. Seeds can carry diseases that will ruin crops. And if crops fail due to disease in the seed, that means bad luck for everyone. For crop failures make your groceries cost more. Well, that's where chemical research steps in to help the farmer and everybody who buys the things the farmer raises. Today, chemists provide disinfectants for treating seeds before they are planted. An accident that happened almost 300 years ago marked the beginning of chemical seed treatment. About the year 1670, a sailing vessel loaded with wheat was wrecked near Bristol, England. Farmers living along the coast salvaged some of the grain from the wreck. But since the seawater had spoiled it for flour, they planted it for seed. They noticed that the wheat grown from this seed was fairly free from disease, while crops grown from ordinary seed were not nearly as healthy. The news spread, and for about a hundred years, it was common practice to treat seed with salt water. It was not until our own times, after the turn of the 20th century, that the greatest progress was made in seed treatment. DuPont chemists, among others, realized that here was a real need to be filled by chemistry. Today, the farmer can protect his crops against disease, no matter what he wishes to grow, because chemists are supplying materials that do the job and do it well. When you look at a kernel of seed corn, the surface seems hard and smooth like a piece of china. Actually, it is full of tiny cracks that are hiding places for harmful germs. To reach these parasites, scientists have devised chemicals that by contact or by forming a gas, penetrate every crack. The results of seed treatment are clearly shown at harvest time. Potatoes, for example. Farm tests show that modern chemical treatment of seed potatoes creates an average increase in the crop of more than 35 bushels to the acre. And there are better potatoes, too. The cost of treating the seed is as little as 36 cents per acre. Similar chemical treatment likewise protects flowers, bulbs, and vegetables. And all this means greater success for the farmer a mighty important citizen in this America of ours, and better, cheaper food for your dinner table. That's what happens when chemists go to work. In the close partnership of the chemist and the farmer, we see another fulfillment of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now, Dr. Monaghan. It is once more a pleasure to give you a question which will be answered on the Cavalcade of America at this time next week. Who made the most famous midnight ride in American history? I can almost hear a hundred thousand voices say, Paul Revere, you are correct. So I'll phrase the question for next week's program this way. What woman in American history made a midnight ride as notable and even more spectacular than that of Paul Revere? Good night. <laughs> The orchestra and musical effects this evening, as usual, were under the direction of Don Bury. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present an original radio drama based on Tal Kama's story of Mahitable Wings, starring Jeanette Nolan. This is Thomas Kalma saying good night and best wishes from the DuPont Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company.